Welcome to Bitcoin stuff. So this is Christina's story. Uh, and uh, you have been producing some some fabulous videos that I have uh, enjoyed a, a lot. And so I'd like to, to talk about some of the things that you that you said in in your videos. And to me, like you have managed to uh, express some things you know that that i i have been struggling to express you know so um uh and uh so in in your most recent video well the, the last the last two videos you did you said that uh volatility is life and uh you said that you have to plan ahead so that you can feel alive and that's how you need to plan is will will i be able to feel alive so i would like you to uh to talk about that a little bit i do want to acknowledge that um although you um said that you, you may be struggling with expression um i myself found you know enormous sort of motivation and resonance in a lot of the things that you have said. So from the very outset, before I even um, connected with you, I felt that you were one of the people that I was having conversations with. So thank you for that. Um, yeah, I definitely think that volatility is a sign of life in the sense that if we look around at the natural world, for example, I live uh, less than 50 feet from the ocean. Um, you see that wave patterns have a degree of regularity, but they also have some real outliers. And you know that the ocean is um, sending you all kinds of messages, some of them from very, very far away in the random fifth wave or in the wave that takes the other angle. Um, so I think on a kind of big metaphorical basis, we can talk about volatility, movement, um, being a sign of life. I mean, I think, Death is, by definition, very static. I think in a more specific context, the thing that, that's really been resonating for me when I listen to a lot of the people who talk in the space, particularly those who are trading, uh, whether it's in altcoins or it's in Bitcoin itself, or people who are crossing over from traditional markets, um, and there's a kind of hysteria and fear around volatility, right? Much like this ridiculous language around crash and so on. Yes. And, you know, <laughs> and, yet, and right, right? And yet simultaneously, a lot of these same people are ones who are very au courant on the critique of the stock market and the bond market as being. You know, <laughs> I like how you said they were au courant. <laughs> au courant, right? I mean, they're really great forces. And, and you know, some, of them, some of them, I mean, there's a, a gentleman, you know, crypto investor who for years wrote for Seeking Alpha, you know, so, so absolutely is even participating in creating the au courant um, narrative, insight, whatever you want to call it, into the fact that there is something deeply alarming about the the complete lack of volatility in the markets that for at least 150 years have been the site of volatility. And that the things that were not volatile were the instruments that represented a risk-free rate of return. And I would argue that since 2009, the thing that really got broken was any kind of legitimate risk-free rate of return. Wow. Ultimately, we have no savings mechanism. So, sorry, we, just to go back to an earlier point, if if you ever feel like I'm au courant on anything, you can just shoot me <laughs> right there. <laughs> I shall immediately. I shall <laughs> send my eight-year-old to explain to you exactly uh, what courant you should be doing. <laughs> <laughs> but... Um, uh, right. So, no, but back to your point on on the stock market and the the lack of volatility in the stock market. To to me, like it it is really helpful to think of like you know the the market that's like numbers, that's price charts and everything. But it, you need to think of it as people shouting their voices, and absolutely. they they use money to to say what they're thinking. And right, absolutely, absolutely. I mean, I. You know, one of the most interesting things about um, um, getting distracted by Bitcoin, right, is that it has returned to me a whole lot of ideas and information that I've had for most of my life, but it has charged it with like deeper understanding, right? So 
while I kind of intellectually understood that price um, and price discovery is one of the most profound forms of human expression, I'm really beginning to grasp it in a real life experiential kind of way because here we are in the um, crypto universe, right? Particularly as you move into any kind of like, even just observation, like sitting at the, um, sitting at the Coliseum and kind of watching, watching these numbers. And if you understand what you're looking at, aggregate emotions and all the rest of it, it's really fascinating to see um, actual price discovery in action. And it highlights the fact that, as far as I'm concerned, as somebody who's been generally managing my own resources for as long as I can remember, the, 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 the terrifying thing about the stock market is the stock market and the bond market has come to function the way that, say, UK gilts or um, treasuries 45, 50 years ago used to function. They have become the place, erroneously, but they have become the place in which there is only allowed to be the tiniest amount of kind of price movement yeah. Because the entire structure is dependent upon that being risk free in the sense that it will cover people's 401k pensions and it will allow people to continue to completely ignore all of the unfunded oh liabilities. So so just to to um to go back to my earlier point, like what does that sound like? Like to me, like this 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 kind of price chart, it looks like a bunch of people who are all kind of like moving together and they are all doing the same thing and it is you know like a like a group think room where whereas a, a a room that was actually connected to reality would have you know tons of crazy people you know screaming all kinds of nonsense in it that, that's that's kind of like that's kind of the, the nature of of the world the, the the market should connect you with uh everybody and uh, so it, you know, of course it, it should be crazy. Um, I agree, I uh, agree, I agree completely. I mean, I think, you know, my mom was, my mom was one of these people who was a secretary who, who kind of got herself into being a broker um, at a time where absolutely just like out of the movies, you know, people were yelling and screaming and all the rest of it within a, within already a very uh, confined environment, but much less so than we have today. So the who was an insider and who could be trading on information um, has consistently kind of gotten smaller and smaller and smaller. And the thing that to me is so interesting about the crypto markets is that you have something that looks like a live market, exactly what you're talking about. You have, I keep having this vision of, um, of the Roman forum, you know, in sort of 70 AD. And you didn't show up at the forum uh, with somebody handing you a sheet saying, now look, these are the scammers and these are right. the <laughs> and these are the really, sh and here's the merchant that you can always get a great honest price from, right? Yeah. The forum, the forum gave a competitive advantage to people who were smart enough or informed enough or skeptical enough. I think it's interesting that the Romans gave us so much law because essentially what the Romans did was that they said, look, we're not gonna try and regulate this insanity that's down here, but if you people have issues with each other, here are some courts and you can go and argue out uh, whatever it is that you're, you know, wow, you got fleeced. Okay, well, take it to the courts, right? You yeah. take it to the courts. We're not gonna sit here and try and protect you from being stupid. So the thing that's so interesting about crypto is that while we hear, you know, to me, it's kind of interesting that there are so many articulate voices who support passionately decentralization and um, all of the kind of, you know, very powerful intellectual stuff around uh, freedom and so on and so forth. But the moment that something happens in the markets that they don't like, they have a reflexive reaction to say, where is the SEC? The Korean exchanges are not allowed to do that with Bcash. Yes. Oh my God, do you know what DDAX did? Yes, and, that's and, cheating. <laughs> You know, and, and I have sympathy, right? It's led me to think about the ways in which, you know, I think I've said this before, Bitcoin, if it's the internet of money, it's the internet of voting, right? There will be the possibility for a renegotiated consensus around how we tax and or distribute, what kind of rules we do or do not want to put in place. But the we in that case is the Bitcoin community, which is no longer a national entity, right? So this idea, much like you know, Roman Forum or coffee houses in London in 1720, 
or even the U.S. stock markets in the 1960s. You know, there's a, a, a legitimate framework that people generally work out. And then you have the capacity to see all kinds of different crazy people, right? All, and, and the more that you study the reality of the Bitcoin phenomenon, and especially if you're an, uh, an Anglo-American and you start to think about the fact that U.S. markets only represent a third of the volume. This is a global phenomenon. You have to now start accounting for crazy in all kinds of languages, yeah. in all kinds of culture contexts, right? Um, and that's very exciting. That's, that's, that's very cool because that's humanity in motion through price. Absolutely. And so, you know, when I used to write my articles, I, I wrote um, one called I Love Bitcoin's Volatility right. in 2013, I think. And this was something like my friends and I would just make jokes about how, you know, we would talk, we would hear kind of the same silly argument over again. So we would just be like, let's just do one article so that we never have to have this particular argument again. And that was the I Love Bitcoin's Volatility article. Because to me, it's kind of like, so? Like, it's volatile? Who cares? What? <laughs> what? How could you be complaining about this? It's like, oh, you know, I'm I'm twice as wealthy again today. Uh, <laughs> whatever. <laughs> right, no, it's, a, it's an interesting, it's a, it's a really important point, though, because it makes me realize that, like, people's expression of anxiety around volatility is half the sentence. You know, you can be um, anxious about the price if you add a time frame or a motivation to your expression around volatility. Because if you know that you need to get that money out and into fiat in the next three months or three minutes or five days, right? If you have some kind of framework that justifies why a price movement is problematic for you, then A, finish the sentence, and B, reconsider putting the stuff in in the first place. I mean, one of the best, right, if the, if the advice investment-wise is that if the price of something is keeping you awake at night, you own too much of it, you know, and that essentially you've got to kind of take your own emotional anxieties as the, the, the deepest and most real kind of market insights for you whoever you the investor is, right? Right. Like, because you who is actually mitigating things like risk, uh, uncertainty. I mean, I, I, I had a conversation with my sister a little bit along these lines, um, kind of exploring the idea that while I understand why and how people think in fiat terms, right? I think that once you go into the Bitcoin crypto space to continually reference, particularly altcoins, to dollar, Makes no sense to me. And if you're going to trade, to trade in order to increase dollar amount makes no sense to me. Unless, <laughs> right? Unless you are in this precisely with a plan need to cash out into fiat in a reasonably short time frame, weeks, months, maybe a year. Okay, if that's what you're doing, then that's a whole nother cup of tea and you're somebody who hasn't fundamentally gotten into this because first, second, and third, it is censorship resistant. First, second, and third, it goes to the idea of investment as a return of the money, right? Well, let me so, let me interrupt for a second there, because uh, so like one one thing that I like about you, okay, well, let me get step. One thing that Aristotle said is that a, <laughs> the mark <laughs> the mark of a uh, a, an enlightened mind is to entertain a proposition without believing it. It was something like that. Right, right. So right. when I first read that, I was like, well, that doesn't sound very hard. <laughs> Low standards, <laughs> Aristotle. But <laughs> once I got out into the real world, I was like, oh, man, that that is a really good way to judge people, you know? So what, what you did was you, uh, uh, you, you can go – into the the dollar mentality and into the bitcoin mentality and and go back and forth so you you are thinking about a person who is thinking about his investments in terms of dollars okay right or you can also think about a person who is purely just thinking in terms of getting the most bitcoins and the price of bitcoins to dollars at the time is kind of whatever and these are these are right. two very different mindsets, and uh, you are able to go in between them. 
And you know, you know what else? I, you you can believe both of them at the same time because you you understand that each of them is is a a competing like a you know um uh so social construct. You or know, religion. It's, or right. Religion. Oh yeah, yeah, religion. Right. Each of them is like each of them is a competing religion, and uh, you you can you can entertain both of them at the same time and choose which one you like better. So it's precisely, not like... Precisely, and to recognize that there are a different set of tools for assessing one's sort of emotional intellectual orientation depending on which framework you're operating in, whether that's an abstract exercise or it's because you actually happen to own a Facebook share, right? Um, and I do think that, to, I think I said this in one of my videos, is that like, I think the only way to prevent oneself from really disappearing down a cult or fundamentalist framework is to be as as honest with oneself about what one is choosing to believe in and that it is a choice. So that if you don't maintain some kind of meta framework, one does run the risk of becoming sort of um, a slave to one's own beliefs without even remembering that there are other belief systems out there. So. I think the other thing that I want to say to this point is that I hear a lot of people in the space talking about institutional money. And a lot of times I hear people talking in a way that um, is, it's as if it's a kind of behemoth, you know? Yeah. And, no. and, right? And, uh, it, and, and, and This mystifies and, me too. Like to me, it's <laughs> like, the, like you cannot tame the market insanity. There is not like some secret council of Illuminati that's like, you know, managing all the chess pieces. It's just fucking crazy nonsense, guys. Right, Even if you're right. big, it's fucking crazy lunacy, okay? <laughs> right. I think you're completely right. And I think even I said to you this in private, right? Of course, it would be so much simpler if there were a cabal of people sitting in a room somewhere that we could just happily go ensconce to you know, play golf for the rest of your life. We'd right. have <laughs> Oh, good. We send them to your island, right? Um, yeah. But when I also hear that people talking about institutional money, you know, the investment banks that are so clearly kind of known to uh, you know everybody, right? They're like McDonald's and uh, and Burger King. But I think the thing that, in terms of mass adoption or um, you know the big money or the real money, I think what people need to understand is that there are tens, if not hundreds, of thousands of family wealth offices all over the place, right? There are all kinds of aggregates of individuals whose money is going to be coming from the fiat systems, yeah? who are going to have to need to continue to think about these things. And until such time as we get to hyper-Bitcoinization, right? until we get to a place where there's a tipping point in a number of things, all of us, including the most dedicatedly holy crypto people, are going to have to continue to navigate a world in which a lot of people are thinking in dollars, right? Right. Well, so um, well, let me let me quick compliment you again, and then we'll go on to uh, the the last topic that I wanted to discuss. Well, so like in in Bitcoin, it it just feels like I am constantly like hearing people uh, just babble about like crypto programming nonsense that. Mm -hmm is like almost irrelevant to everything. And that is like 90% of, of what people talk about in Bitcoin. They're like, we've invented this amazing new uh, matho crypto something, you know, that is going, and it's like, guys, it doesn't, it doesn't matter what it is. It just, it can be anything and you throw it out there tons of idiots will buy it. Like it doesn't, it doesn't like, how can you like, it, 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 all right, of that right, is a right, mask. Right, right. And, and the kind of things that, that you talk about are what's really important. <laughs> and it's like almost nobody wants to talk about it. <laughs> I want to talk about the, the Bitcoin God now. And, and we'll say Bitcoin okay. Goddess with parentheses around the, the desk, because I think we're going to have to have a, an argument about, about this. We but, might, we might, we might preempt. We might preempt it at the outset and go for the Greek third. I mean, why do we have to be trapped in our Latinate roots of like male female? We could just go for the for the third, the third Greek. Oh, sure. um, well, what I, what I was going to say is the the Bitcoin God is however I want him or her to be for the particular point that I'm trying to make at that time. <laughs> that works for me. That's entirely self-referential, and I think that in this in this kind of 
you know, it's it's a game, but it's also a real thing. Um, I thought about this quite seriously, and if I were going to do the anthropomorphization of God, and I were going to give whatever it is a gender or a pronoun, I'm going with us and they. Okay. Um, because oh, yeah, yeah, very good. Well, let me let me quick talk about the the Bitcoin God first, because I. I did a video about the Bitcoin God and I did an imitation of Yahweh and I said, I'm going to rain uh, punishment down upon you if you don't do what I want. <laughs> oh, and I like the part where everything's exploded and, and I don't, I have to admit, I don't because you know, I'm new to the party, but I don't remember his name, but you were like, and you, I shall put over here. Yes. <laughs> Yeah. So I, I in, my, in my video, so there's there's a person I like called Paul Stortz. Yeah, so I, I put him in the center. I think he should be the new leader. And uh, I put Adam back and uh, Nick Zabo to the side. And they're old cypherpunks. And they were, you know, they came up with great stuff back in the day. But uh, I, I, it is, it is, uh, uh, I think I think that they, they it is time for them to take a second second in command position. <laughs> and who was the who was the there was a there was a person who came out and was put kind of at the very far end of your desk was not. Oh yeah, that's uh, Vitalik Buterin, the, uh, that the uh, that Ethereum that's guy. <laughs> right, that's what it was, and that to me, you know, really, I mean, that was that was very profound visualization of something that otherwise people write entire articles about. So yeah, yeah. that that worked for me. Oh well, thanks. But to me, like the the Bitcoin God is not, it it is not imaginary. the 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 process by which uh, our brains learn, like individual neurons in our brains learn, is very similar to what happens in a market. Right. If, if the neuron. If the neuron in my brain correctly predicts what my arm is going to do, then that neuron is going to be rearranged to be in the more the more important part. It's going to be the higher level thinking part of my brain because it's going to be rewarded for correctly predicting my my motion, you know? And that makes me a more unified person. This process and it is it is the same thing that happens in the market is if you make good predictions then you get rewarded you get more and if you make bad ones then you sh you shrink so i i actually i really like um like uh uh size metaphors like gargantua and pentagruel cuz the any or, or um you know uh, uh gulliver's travels right but, right or, or Alice in Wonderland is the best because Alice actually changes sizes in yes. that story, and you you are it is it is like you are changing size. If you uh, correctly predict the future, you get bigger, and if if you you are wrong, you get smaller. That's how I imagine it. I imagine that it's like Alice in Wonderland, and uh, if if you uh, predict the future, that's finding the the correct uh, side of the mushroom. You know. I completely agree with you. I love I love the fact that you brought up Gulliver's Travels. I think that's awesome. And um, I think the most appropriate metaphor is Alice in Wonderland. I don't think it's like the Kool-Aid, but it's definitely uh, whatever it is that Alice was eating. And I think you make an <laughs> excellent, excellent, excellent point, right? I hadn't, I hadn't really thought about it that way, but that's entirely resonant. And I think what it goes to is that feeling of being alive, right? That volatility gives one. And the feeling of being in a learning process um, by getting smaller and bigger, whether that's like seeing it reflected in the size of your portfolio or it has to do with, you know, that actual physical sense you get when the neurons are really working hard. Um, you know, the idea of something stretching your brain is really not just linguistic metaphor. Um, I think your I think your point about the neurons because this is this is a thing that you're very articulate on and very powerful on because your way of describing the virtue of the kind of um, I was going to say violence but you know there's something very primal about if a neuron fucks up it's going to die right excuse my language right and if you 
either predict the market wrong or you don't inform yourself well enough or more to the point, you predict yourself wrong. Because I think a lot of success in the market has to do with predicting yourself correctly. Oh, absolutely. What are my responses going to be? You know, what are my weaknesses with regards to whether it's fear or greed or whatever, right? So the 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 experience that one has when uh, the neuron encounters a dead end is is very zero sum, and that's uh, I think a powerful point if you're going to advocate for the rigors of freedom right because yeah. if the bitcoin god is anything if the bitcoin's narrative is anything um it, it does have to do with those kind of core philosophical ideas around autonomy and freedom well, let me just clar clarify something real quick then, just just so that people don't get the wrong idea. Like if you know, if you shrink down to nothing, that doesn't mean that you are, are literally going to die. That just means that you have to be an employee. So <laughs> when, when I when I talk about these these death metaphors, I just I don't I just don't want people to uh you know have have the picture of uh you know uh uh people people being crushed under the wheels of capitalism you know you know right, if you go to right, zero right. Then, you don't die you're just an employee you know right and this is and there's and there's two things that's i love that too like you know I absolutely resonate with that um but i think there are two things right one is to remember that alice in wonderland when she gets really small she discovers a whole nother world right she finds a way to then get big again so there is uh, a piece there about the the resistance and the capacity to rebuild and so on, which is important to not lose sight of, even on a macro sense, which is if we all woke up tomorrow and Bitcoin had gone to zero. And what it relates to is my sense of, you know, people have to really have um, not superficial conversations with themselves about what risks they are willing to take and feel comfortable with, and not just use these facile kind of statements about, you know, don't invest more than you'd be happy to lose. Well, that's BS. You, you know, you're never going to be happy to lose, but you have to get into your own psychology and recognize that um, if you're going to, if you're going to play a game where you run the risk of going to zero, then you need to have already thought about what is plan B. Yeah. So if you want to escape being an employee. Yeah. You need a mistake. You need a you mistake buffer. Get to zero. Yeah. You, you, know? you need you need a mistake buffer. You need to be able to make lots of mistakes without uh, being uh, being ruined. You know, I you love that. I love that. I, I watched that recently of yours again, right? Where you were talking about um, the dangers of trading, because I think you're absolutely right, and I and I think that finds kind of correspondence in the virtue of a virtual portfolio. The idea that um, you know, if you have ten thousand dollars, you might want to teach yourself by playing with five first. Yeah. Um, you know, and that you have to be humble with regards to learning your own self, as much as you are learning whether or not Neo is the next platform or not the next platform. Yeah, that's that's great advice, and also like you can't learn it by just watching the markets, because as right. as you pointed out. When you are making real bets, you are learning about yourself too. So it is not enough exactly. to watch the price charts. You you have to actually do it, and you you discover your weaknesses as you go along. Exactly, because it's all well and good to listen to a wonderful range of YouTubers and anybody else. You know, again, repeat the mantras which have value, right? Um, with regards to fear and greed and FOMO and FUD and then and then and then. Um, but until you've actually run yourself through, okay, what actually are the contours of my fear? What are the contours of my greed? What can I do to, for example, if I know intellectually that 2 or 3% compounded on a regular basis is the way to get rich, if I know that that's the math that works, then don't ever put yourself in a position where you don't set a limit at 3% higher than what you just bought at. And you know, don't confuse the kind of excitement, uh, whatever dopamine, biochemistry, whatever, whatever, whatever. Like, don't don't put yourself in a position where you are trying to control something that you don't really have any hope of controlling. Structure it so that you can't.
get that money onto the exchange, or you can't make bets that are bigger than ice cream money. At least until such time as you actually feel like you have some idea of what you are doing with regards to you. Because the thing that is true about Bitcoin itself and the whole market is that you don't just learn it once. You are having to learn it every day because it is developing. It is so infant. It is it is something that is mesmerizing simply because it is, you know, volatility in price. Well, that's nothing compared to the volatility and development of the social revolution, the supranational entity that, you know, there's all of this it, incredible movement and, um, and growth uh, and who knows in which direction, all directions at once. Okay. Well, so, well, I, I wanted to go back so, to the Bitcoin God. So anyway, my, well, my point is the Bitcoin God is not, just a metaphor because to me the, the market is a big brain and you you are contributing your neurons to the big brain and when you get money you are you are rewarding the the neurons in in your brain that were part of the big brain you know it, it's just like the, them as a, a part of of your brain you know it's it is the it's the same process so the bitcoin god is the, all, all of the neurons that everybody is contributing to the market process and uh, the, the Bitcoin God's body is the world uh, and the Bitcoin God is smarter on average than in the individual person in it. And uh, to me, if you disagree, that makes you a retarded person, honestly, like... Uh, you just don't understand how it works that you know if you think that you don't understand yet i think you're right it made me think about what i can't remember what i think it's called golem there's a project out there to connect all the computers in the world to make a you know supercomputer and what you're saying makes it you know perfectly clear that that that's a secondary because in fact what is happening is that we are creating a, a kind of a, a geographically oriented uh, human super brain. And, and that is really what is, I think, happening. I mean, we can talk about the ways in which things like, you know, whatever, Facebook and anything else has connected humanity with each other and so on. But I think that the ways in which humans, <laughs> you know how I feel about Facebook. But I think the, the, the thing about the way in which Bitcoin is connecting people to what you're saying, there is an aggregating, um, I guess it's a function, and, and that, you know, I I have only a neophyte's kind of understanding. My tech my tech understanding is reasonably good, but it's not my deepest. I think one of the things that maybe is happening is that we're we're developing that the god is the algorithm, and we are creating it through all of these neural connections that anybody who is in the space is bringing to it through price expression. And so if you are getting hammered by the price movement, maybe you're not connected enough properly to the neural network, maybe you don't understand it and or are not contributing correctly. Yeah. And that's a totally new thought. That part. makes sense to me. Um, so, uh, so, so I did my video about the Bitcoin God and then I saw your video later. I now I don't remember what the time, which video this was, but there's one where you're talking about the Bitcoin price, and you were like, uh, "This is this is what she thinks" or something. I, I don't remember exactly what you said. So my my first thought was like, "Whoa, this is a power play." I before I was the only prophet of the Bitcoin God, and now we've got a new one. And then I was like, "Wait, wait a minute. That's that's pretty much exactly what I wanted to happen because uh, the, I, you know, I, I want people to to be be their own leaders. So you know, you should you should be the prophet, so that I don't have to bother. You know." Uh, well, I mean, you have you have the perfect investor like mentality, right? Like, I want to seek my stuff and go on to the next things, right? Like, right. <laughs> you all figure it out. I have my bases covered, and I'm, you know. So, but, um, so that was my first thought, but my second thought was like, like she is trying to to infect the Bitcoin world with with her cooties, with this. Uh, <laughs> oh this my God, feminism. 
<laughs> with this uh, this goddess figure. But then I got to thinking about that too, and I I thought that's the well, that's kind of appropriate too, because you know goddesses they're often kind of like yeah you you fight fight for me you know and that's kind of what i've been telling people to do <laughs> right, which, is maybe, which is maybe what because you know i saw your stuff which helped me feel really um less inhibited about you know making a video and talking about that kind of thing um and i think the not to be too uh too whatever pointed about it but you know i think the first video we made was on chimps and bonobos so if we wanted to take you know kind of generalized gender stereotypes blah blah um you know yeah there is something to be said about the fact that machiavelli you know talks as much about the art of persuasion as he talks about the art of force and of course is always pointing out that like if you can get them to follow you by choice as opposed to through the uh then you know right. you've got a more loyal army, um, and then just one, just one other riff, right? Which is that I don't mean to be like, uh, oh, I don't know, kind of sanctimonious about it. It's not where I'm coming from at all. Um, but I think the idea that the that the Bitcoin God is a is an us and a they, you know, an us, uh, it's a we and a they. It's 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 it is an aggregate, and part of the discomfort, I think. Um, that I see people in the space sort of n negotiating is that the Bitcoin God is broader and bigger than any individual. Yeah. That it is the aggregate and that you're going to have to get comfortable with the idea that there are a lot of different minds interpreting something that is the aggregate of all of those minds. And you don't get to hive off your own little thing and uh and declare that it is the only thing you can declare that it is the thing that guides you in your relationship with the bitcoin god but you you can't i don't think in any real honesty you kind of undermine the power of the thing itself um by not recognizing that it's got this tremendous aggregating networking effect well, so so let me let me tell you my thoughts on on that. Uh, to me, you you say uh, the Bitcoin God is like this, and then if the Bitcoin God likes that picture, that's mm -hmm. what it will become. And uh, if you predict correctly, then uh, you get to be the most important prophet. So um, that's that's what I'm. Mm -hmm. That's what I've been working on. <laughs> And, and I am not here to deny the power of the position of the prophet. I mean, you and I are aligned in this. If I, I have been, uh, I've been somebody who, um, for all, you know, if we trot out the CV, there are a lot of um, influential positions that I've sort of chosen not to occupy. And Bitcoin has actually allowed me to have some relationship with my own um, vocational ambition, whatever it is, and to have found a place where I, I, I feel legitimate in my own um, passion to 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 be prophet like um, is is really cool, right? I haven't really wanted to use my powers for a whole range of other things, um, even though there are many who would have said, "Are you crazy? Why are you not ruling the world yet?" And I've been all focused on, "Well, I'd like to just rule the <laughs> world," you know? Like, can yeah. I get? rulership of my own world under control here um so so yeah i do i think it is a testimony to the power of the thing that bitcoin is drawing people both into a space and making connections between types of people um that previously again not to just trash facebook but the, but you know cupcakes and birthday you know whatever the the, the vehicle <laughs> have not been super profound this is so ridiculously profound that the kinds of connections people make with each other and the kinds of um, neural networking that's going on, right, are really like the handful of times that we have seen major world religion meaning system shifts. So, 
so yeah, it does feel like something that's worth kind of putting on some white robes and going out and saying, hey, I would like to um, help shape the development simply by providing some commentary on what it is that I think I see. Yeah, well, and uh, speaking of uh, connections, uh, I got to be friends with you. So that's great. Exactly, exactly, exactly. And I think that I think the other thing that is awesome about Bitcoin, I mean, speaking personally, but I think I, I know this for for a number of my friends who are who are who are have not even yet gotten to the point where they've bought Bitcoin. But the the nature of the connections, because they are by definition based on stuff that people have to really think about. And even if you are for the first time in your life thinking about what is money or vulnerabilities or wow, the world around me really does look potentially quite fascist. And that doesn't matter if you're left or right. How do I protect myself? And for a lot of people, they are coming to have connections with other people around topics that really are deep and meaningful. You don't even have to try to make them deep and meaningful. No yeah. emojis. You don't need emojis. Well, I, I don't, don't have like anything emojis. to add to that. That was great. And thanks a lot for... Uh, joining me for this conversation. So do you have any closing thoughts? Not, not really, only just that I think this in and, of, in and of itself, the kind of thing that we're doing um, is as kind of reflective of the value of the exercise as uh, how many dollars you can go out and buy with a Bitcoin. Oh, okay. Well, I, I guess I'm going to close with um, a, uh, a war cry, uh, Bitcoin new <laughs> Akbar. <laughs> and inshallah bitcoin 